with anybody confronting somebody or taking up some, an issue with somebody, if they have stolen from you, if they have wronged you, I have no problem with that. But there needs to be a uh, proper way of going about it. And the first issue that we had that a lot of people, uh, I think, were some of the comments of we need to solve crime stem from, the stolen property that was recovered in that was never reported to us. Therefore, we never had a case on that. And because of the way uh, it was went about, um, the individuals in taking care of that tainted the case where we did not have an opportunity to prosecute that case. So again, I don't have any issues with, with anybody um, talking to somebody about what they did. But in the manner that you handle it, uh, basically works against us and does not give us an opportunity uh, to do the job that we need to do. So that's really all I'm going to say about that. Um, I just, uh, the other case, the second case that we had, um, there were some comments made again that why we didn't catch something, and the stolen property in that case was actually stolen out of the county, which is out of our jurisdiction, uh, which leaves us with, with not a lot to do as far as being there to catch the crime in progress in the stolen property. Um, in that particular case, uh, really ended out pretty decent because we were able to secure a search warrant and get the property back. I would rather handle it another way, but that's the way it went, and, and it really turned out in the long run, to be all right. Um, on the topic of our schedule, I know there's been a lot of uh, different ideas, uh, different talk on how we should do our schedule. Um, the manner in which we do our schedule is something that we are constantly looking at and something we're constantly working on. Um, and the way we do it right now is what we feel, um, crime statistic-wise, when we have crimes going on, the kind of crimes we have going on, um, is the way that we do that. We have uh, some of the opinion that we should have officers on all throughout the night hours and just have officers on call during the daytime hours. And as far as I'm concerned, and as far as our police department is concerned, that's unacceptable. We are not going to have officers uh, at home asleep and on call when our school is in session and when our businesses are open. Um, I don't, I don't want to compare or, you know, miss, I mean, I do want to say one thing is more important than the other, but in our eyes, when it comes to stolen property or a personal crime where somebody is hurt, we need to be able to respond to the situations while an officer is on duty so we can get there quick. Um, so, with three officers, basically the way we work it right now is uh, Myself as the chief, I work a day shift, uh, scheduled Monday through Friday, however, when these guys need weekends off, need to burn vacation, that kind of thing, then I work weekends. Um, when they need me to come to nights, I work nights. Um, Sergeant Rudy uh, really kind of gets the wrong end of the stick um, because he works a split shift in which uh, on the weekends or to cover my days off, he will work uh, either two or three day shifts and then he will turn around and work a couple night shifts. and. Uh, Officer Brown's the night out, basically. Um, I know there's some comments as to why we don't switch that around. The biggest reason we don't switch that around is because by the time it comes to switch it around, you end up having an officer either working a 24-hour shift straight, so you can turn that around and you have somebody working overtime uh, or something like that. Um, uh, I know we've come into questions about uh, with the fourth officer about money issues. Um, some of the council members feel that we're, that, uh, it costs too much money. In all, reaction, in all actuality, without doing an actual comprehensive study, just sitting down and taking some time and putting a pencil to paper, the money savings, having four full-time officers versus three, by the time you pay the overtime, is only around $10,000 a year. So I don't want people to think that, well, first of all, the city has the money to pay. Um, if, they, if they didn't have the money to pay, <laughs> I had a hard time with the fact that they allowed me to keep it in my budget for the past two years with only three officers. Um, I'm very thankful that they allowed me to keep it because had that not been in there, I wouldn't be able to cover the overtime uh, for what uh, all, you know, primarily these two are working because I work overtime and I'm salary, so I don't get paid overtime. Um, so you can see the amount of overtime that's getting paid out in just these two guys throughout a year if the cost comparison, uh, keeping four officers versus three, is roughly only about $10,000 a year. 
Yes, sir. How much is your overtime paid out in, let's say, the last year? How much have you paid out in overtime? As far as a dollar amount? Yeah. I honestly couldn't tell you that. I think it's like 4000 bucks. I was told. How many hours a week on average? Per, we, we, we do a pay period of every two weeks. We get paid on we get paid on. So 80 hours regular time? Mm -hmm. How many hours overtime? We are, we are averaging between a, a pay period between 30, I mean, sometimes it might be 16, sometimes it might be 38. Okay. Um, so 16 to 38 hours. 16 to 38 hours, a pay period, yes. And that, that can come in, I mean, that can come in many forms. That can come in, in covering a day off. Um, that can cover in cover, cover the training time, but that can also cover in the fact that when, because some of our, uh, well, because all of our shifts include call time, um, if they work their eight hour shift and they get called out for their own call time, and obviously beyond 40 hours, they're paid over time. Yes. Uh, when you come committing on the South, are you including the mandatory training time for the annual and stuff in the overtime calculations? Because you guys have, I understand, mandatory training time as well, right. don't you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's all figured in. We're, uh, each officer in the state of Kansas is required to maintain 40 hours of continuing education every year, which, which equates to a week. However, that's the minimum. Um, obviously, it's my goal and these guys' goal to be as well trained as we possibly can. Um, so I would estimate, you know, even even just the minimum for us of 40 hours coming out to three weeks a year, I would estimate our actual training time every year is between a month and a month and a half by the time uh, we spend time at the range and that kind of thing. So you've already got a, a month, month and a half out of the year um, that's having to be covered by somebody else, by somebody as a trainer. Um, of course, we've had questions about the cry rate in town. Um, we, we do enjoy a pretty low crime rate, and so the question is how come we need four officers versus three officers? Four officers versus three officers for us has nothing to do with the crime rate. Uh, it basically has uh, everything to do with allowing the officers adequate time off. Um, right now, if one of us is sick and we call in sick, which very more times than not we work sick because Number one, we don't have to stick one of our guys working that over, a day of overtime on our day off, or we don't want to have somebody have to work a 24-hour shift to cover it if somebody's already gone to train. And we're to the point now to where uh, we've been very fortunate. Um, December will be two years in which we've been down uh, the fourth officer. We've been very fortunate that nobody has seriously gotten hurt, you know, twisted a knee uh, or something like that, but they had to be off an extended period of time, and then we've got two officers working 24-7, and I, I think anybody can see where that would cause some major issues if that was to come up. Can you speak to the point of if you have a week's vacation, how your schedule works? If who has a week's vacation? The way our vacation, I mean, obviously it's just, it's just like most other places, the longer you've been there, the more vacation you're Charlie being at three years, I'm not quite sure where he's at on that. Um, so yes, I mean, th that's the thing. I can't, as a chief, I can't deny somebody their vacation time. So if Aaron comes to me and says, I'm taking two weeks vacation, then Charlie and I are working two days, two weeks in a row, until we get another day off when he comes back. Covering how many hours in that day? Each of us would cover 12. There is on call time at this point. If we didn't have on call time at this point, right. and we did three eight-hour shifts, mm -hmm. then we'd all be working 24-7 right. right. without days off or anything. Okay. So um, we work 12. Yeah. 12, so basically, it's an eight-hour shift with four hours of on call time. And, and of course, you know we do our best to stagger that. It's very difficult uh, during the day shift to do that during the week, because again, I am very proactive 100% for having somebody on duty during school hours. We are there before school, we're there at the lunch hour, and we're there after. I do walkthroughs of the school every day. I mean, that's, that is something that basically as a chief, I will not budge on. I, I'm willing to stand here in front of you guys and basically put my job on the line and say that because I've had questions. What are you gonna do if your city council tells you that they want you to flop your schedule 
and they want you guys to work nights to be on call during the day. And you can put it on record, Terry. I will not do that. I will refuse to do that, and if I lose my job, that's something I'm okay with because it is important enough to me, and I believe in being active in that school and keeping our problems down at school to risk that. Another thing as far as, as four officers go, our city council laid out three steps over a period of time that they wanted us to fulfill before they would consider giving us back a fourth officer. Um, they started out by hiring a consultant who came in and evaluated our police department, evaluated our schedule, the way we did things. In the end, he recommended that we be uh, restored back to four officers. Based on uh, that uh, consultant's recommendation, the city council also required the three of us, I'm sorry, asked the three of us if we would uh, submit to psychological testing. We found out after that uh, the consultant had, had told the council and my department, um, he had worked for the, as a city administrator for the city of Hutch, he had told us that the Hutch Police Department requires their officers to do that every three years. That was something I had never heard of. Currently, all officers in the state of Kansas have to pass a psychological screen before they can go to the police academy. After that, uh, the only time it is really ever considered is if you know you have an officer in a, in a, uh, involved in an officer involved shooting, um, if they get an altercation with somebody where they're uh, severely beaten, um, or they have other some other kind of trauma in their life where where an administrator might see that this person needs to be evaluated basically before we put the gun on their hip again. Um, and that's the only time we would do that. Um, the psychologist, obviously I can't go, because of confidentiality, I can't go into details of results. However, the three of us passed that with five counts. That psychologist also recommended that for the well-being of the current officers and the city and the citizens we serve, that we be restored to four officers. Uh, the last thing that they asked is that um, the council and the council and I sat down and we went through the policy manual. We updated a lot of things. Our policy uh, was, was quite antiquated. It was something that needed to be done. And then we got that done. And we were told through this process that as soon as this was completed, we were led to believe that we would be restored to a fourth officer. And that didn't happen. Now again, that's their decision. It's out of my hands. However, that's been a difficult pill for us to swallow when we spent two years believing we would eventually be restored to that after we um, complied with these things. Um, and obviously that didn't happen. You don't have any idea how much they paid that consultant, do you? That they ignored? Not because he didn't buy us what they wanted. You don't know if he was there? I don't. I wasn't there at the time. Yeah, it's a simple thing to find out. Yeah, why not send that to me? I'd like to know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how much um, the consultant was paid. I don't know how much the uh, psychologist was paid. Um, that, that's one of those things that typically uh, any, anything that's spit out of my budget, I have to sign off on. But uh, those, those were things that I was not required to sign off on. We've had um, some other questions about volunteers, um, what we could do as far as utilizing volunteers in the community, whether it be just a simple volunteer or a reserve officer. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to come out and say that I'm all, all out against that idea. The problem with that is, is a volunteer can take no action. So in essence, even if you have a volunteer, there still has to be an officer on call and ready to go to handle any call that arises. Um, typically when you see volunteers and reserve officers who are then in uh, Sedgwick County use a lot of reserve officers, but they're used in conjunction with the officers that are already on duty. And basically they're just used as extra eyes and ears um, driving around in a, a city-owned vehicle. They have a radio. Um, nine times out of ten, they're not armed unless they're a retired officer um, or an officer from another jurisdiction that is just volunteering to help. Um, and, and like I said, they're just basically eyes and ears. And then they, they have radios that can tell the deputies, I've got this going on here, and then the deputies respond. Um, so the idea of volunteers, although in theory it is a good idea, um, it does not or give the officer any actual time off because they still have to be on call. And you're still, because they're on call, you're still in one way or another compensating an officer um, who's not actually out on the street work. 
took the officers already on the call for the four hours. Mm -hmm. and he had a volunteer covering that four hours. He'd still be able to respond when he did it on duty. That's right. Yeah. I'm, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is, is this idea came to cover <laughs> right. instead of paying an officer a day of overtime, you could use the like a volunteer. Um, or, you know, for vacation and that kind of thing. But again, it's, it's you know, you can't really take a vacation if you're still at home having to respond to a call. Surgery, you got anything to add? No. Charlie? Now, I, I'm wide open. I, I, uh, I encourage your ideas, your opinions, everything. I mean, if, if any, you're, you're not going to offend me. I hope nothing I've said tonight has offended anybody. Um, so if there are any questions, any ideas, then that was really the meat of why I wanted to call and give you guys an opportunity. Um, I don't have any problems with Facebook. I mean, there was a lot of ideas on our however. Um, <laughs> At some point in time, it, it comes time to to step up and, and you know, in the presence of other people, say what you need to say. Uh, I just want to address the idea that the city can't afford it. You know, I've watched for years, and I sit there and I go through the financials, and the city's making about thirty thousand dollars a month on average profit off of our electric bills. It's nonsense that they can't afford to give you guys the tools and the personnel that you need to do your job to perfect, protect us. Uh, we've got. I know we just spent three million dollars on a water treatment facility to protect about two children. And we can't spend thirty, forty thousand dollars a year to protect our parents and grandparents and our children and everything else I find to be just plain nonsense. And that's all I've got to say about it. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and that's another thing I, I forgot to add. Um, there is also a misconception that with four hours we'll be able to provide provide nonstop twenty four seven coverage. And that's still not the case. Statistically, we would have to have five officers plus a part time to be able to provide 365 days a year of nonstop 24 hour coverage. However, four officers would allow us to do that when somebody's not training, when somebody's not on vacation, and that kind of thing. And again, it comes back more to a basically taking the load off of us, allowing us, because right now, um, by city policy, we're, we're allowed to carry over five, uh, five days of vacation or holiday leave per year. Um, last year, we, give or take a few, we each ended up the year with around 10, between 10 and 15 days that we weren't able to use. Um, they did pay that out for us last year, however, they told us this year, tough. If you don't, if you're not able to use it, then you lose it. And that's another thing that's very hard to swallow when your governing body isn't giving you the people to even be able to use that time, uh, and then you lose it. I mean, to me, that's a benefit, mm -hmm. and you need to either provide it or not, and, and not just kind of, you know, half-heartedly, we're gonna let you use what you can use and, and everything else. I think that consultant said you could cover like 160 and 168 hours or something like that with four officers on the average or something. So well, but the problem that everybody's there that's the thing. The problem with that was is, is training time and sick leave and stuff like that wasn't taken in, into consideration of that equation. Um, and, and that's another thing. We're, we're required a minimum of 40 hours, but training, training is important. I, I want to be as well trained as I can, and I want to provide officers that are well trained as well. So if we have the opportunity to attend three classes where it's only going to cost the city a trip to Hutchinson and lunch, then we're going to do that because by us being better trained, we can better serve you guys. Um, and being in a small department, there's a lot of things that we're not able to train on, like bigger departments are, um, as far as tactics, re, you know, responding uh, to something like if we had an incident at school or something like that. So it's really important that we're not held just to a minimum of 40 hours because, like I said, that's just a minimum. That's just what we have to have to maintain our certification. I would just like to say that this, you know, the walkthrough that you're getting through the school every day. I have a child and I have grandchildren in this school. I've got grandchildren in Stafford and I've got grandchildren in Kinsley. I don't know that those schools are doing that. So for me, 
it's just like this morning, turning on the news. You know, there's more shootings going on in these schools over and over and over. Granted, that's not saying by you taking that walk through that's going to stop it, right. but that is, to me, that's just a security thing for these kids, and, as well as as parents. And, so well, I appreciate it's a, that. One thing I do want to mention about the school shootings, that, that is something that I have spent my entire career <clears throat> studying very heavily, and something that I I'm, um, have attended some training on now, and even taught some training at, our, uh, at the Kansas Peace Officers Association a couple weeks ago. Um, I, I hate to say it, but the media is planting a lot of fear as far as the school shootings go. Statistically, we're not having any more than we've had in the past. You're just seeing it more because of the large scale ones we've had. Now it's, oh my gosh, another shooting and this and this. So, although we do that because that is important, there, there are statistics after statistics that, that prove and show that the walkthroughs um, there's a lot of jurisdictions, bigger jurisdictions, that just park a patrol car in, in the uh, parking lot of the school because that's been shown to deter um, active shooters in the past. So, but again, you know, that's, that's the main focus. Uh, one of the things that at that KPOA training I went to, the keynote speaker was a, an adjacent chief of police to Newtown, Connecticut. And his job um, after that uh, school shooting happened was to take over the Newtown Police Department so the chief of Newtown could handle all the stuff that he needed to handle. Um, Newtown is a town, they, they have about 27,000 people. Um, they average somewhere between, uh, I believe it's eight and 10 or 12 officers on duty per shift. Just the media presence and the people that flooded that town afterwards, they had to have 50 officers on duty for two and a half months after that happened. Of course, that's not something you saw on the news, but if you consider the logistics of a town the size of Great Bend, you know, we don't have enough resources in this area to even cover St. John if something like this happens. And that is why I am so for being as proactive as we possibly can, um, because the thing about it is, uh, Columbine changed the ways, basically changed our tactics. It used to be if you had a mass killing, inside of a building, your patrol officers would show up, they would set up a perimeter, and they would wait for the SWAT team to arrive. Well, we've learned that that's not the way we do things. The way we train now is the first officer on scene is the one who's going to enter that school and do what they can to take out the threat. Now, in a small police department and with the chief of police working day shift, as soon as an officer is involved in a shooting, that immediately takes them out of any investigation or anything to do with that case. So not only do you have to deal with the logistics of what you're going to do with the media and the family and friends and stuff to flood the town, now you've got your administrator of your police department who can have nothing to do with that case. He can't handle the media, he can't handle the investigation, he can't handle incident command or anything like that. So again, there's, there is a lot of logistical things and, and a lot of that kind of things that we're trying to avoid by making sure. Who decides that, Adam? Who says you can't do that? I mean, that's ridiculous. The, the, who says you can't do what? That you can't be a part of the investigation if that was to happen to you. The, the, the Supreme Court says that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. See, you guys, that's where things are screwed up. <laughs> but it must, uh, yeah, but it's well, not. I mean, everybody yeah. asks, but I'm absolutely well, serious about but, it. But, you know, let, me, let, me, let me tell you why it's not. I just, uh, training that I went to last week was, was on uh, officer involved shootings. Um, it was excellent training. And what happens to not just an officer, what happens to anybody that's involved in that kind of an event? It's not safe for them to be taking a part of an investigation, especially if you have a, because here's the thing, if, if we have a school shooting, and say it's in the main hall of our school, and on, on the first officer enters that school, and he's got seven students shot laying there, we can't afford to stop and help those students. We have to get to the shooter. So psychologically, what it does to a person to have to step over dead or dying kids as they're reaching out for you to help and then to have to go shoot somebody, Jerry, you don't want them to charge your business. But that, you know, I, I'm all, I mean, I, that's just, that's ludicrous that the three of you guys, if it happens to you, that, that you can't be a part of it for the next week or two weeks while the investigation is going on. Well, you're, you're out completely. But that, this is where I'm coming from on a lot of this other local stuff, too. 
It's too many people telling one person what they can and can't do because of this rule, this law. It's ridiculous. And I don't disagree with that because we are hamstrung by a lot of things. But the thing about it is, my certification is what feeds my kids. <laughs> I assure you, I'm not going to do anything to get that game. Right, right. You know, um, but that's why that's why I wanted to do this because I want I want to let you guys know what we're doing, why we do, it, why you know, the reasons why we do it, and, and why there are. And just like you said, there's a lot of the criminal has a, has a heck of a lot more rights than you or I. That that's just the way it is. And it sucks. Excuse my language. <laughs> yeah. When, when your statistics that you talked about a while ago, when do they show that the most crimes occur in our area? For our area, when the most crimes occur would be, I mean, I don't, we don't have the resources to do solid statistics, um, but the majority of our crimes occur would be probably between 7 and midnight. Okay. Um, and, and that was another thing that, that I wanted to bring up um, as far as our crime rate goes. We are seeing a lot of our, what we consider little stuff, um, what a lot of officers would consider a nonsense call or, you know, this really isn't my job kind of thing. A lot of that, the majority of that is going down, going way down. But we're seeing the rise of the major stuff. We're seeing a lot more domestic violence. Uh, and not just domestic violence, we're seeing a lot more domestic batteries. Um, and we're not talking about just a guy slapping around his wife. We're talking about weapons used. Uh, we're talking about kids going at their parents with a knife. Um, so aggravated assaults, um, again, you know, the, the major personal crimes, I'm sure you all remember just a couple years ago, we had a shooting here in town. That same year, we had three set of standoffs here in town that we've never had before. And, and just, just both of those standoffs taxed every resource in the county. Because we have three officers, and then the sheriff's department only has four. The sheriff's department only has four to cover the entire county. And by the time you get a minimum of a five-person team to remove somebody out of a house who is refusing to come out that's committed a crime, your resources are used up. Thank goodness we have a very good relationship with Barton County, and we utilize their SWAT team to come down and help both times because we did not have the resources to do that. This is all our the budget that's set aside for that fourth officer. It would be right now we would start an uncertified officer somewhere between twelve and fourteen dollars an hour. And I could not tell you what well it, usually you can you can you can just about double it usually. So fourteen dollars an hour would be roughly twenty eight thousand a year. Um, I can't tell you what the benefit package costs. Do you have any what's your line item though in your budget? You have a dollar amount sitting there? That's for all four? No, the, the way the, our line item for personnel is just one line item. And I can honestly, without looking at that, I couldn't tell you what the exact dollar amount is. So you, you know what your excess was in the last fiscal year? No. <laughs> one thing I am blessed with is that even though I recommend and approve the budget, the city clerk takes care of a lot of that. Um, maybe, go, go ahead. Maybe just talk a little bit about what you guys do on the job side of the car and pick up stray dogs. I'm sure that's <laughs> well, we do a lot of that with skunks and cats and, and every other animal. We are responsible for animal patrol, porcupines, raccoons. What else do we have? We had a coyote the other day that our yeah. we had a coyote the other day that our yeah. fish and game officer, believe it or not, goats picked up and shoved in a, in a thing because yeah. we figured out we figured out it had been somebody's pet that was running around town. A coyote, yes. I mean, it, I was not here. You don't want to raise a coyote or something. It doesn't mean it couldn't wander in. Um, basically, I think it goes without saying, I think you guys can see how much we patrol. We do everything we can to be out on the street when we can be out on the street. Um, again, money wise, distance wise, technology wise, we don't have what it takes. We don't have. Mobile, what they call EDTs, mobile data terminals in our cars, like bigger cities that we can do the reports in our cars. However, that's not something we want to do. An officer should not be sitting in his vehicle with his attention on something else. Why somebody who's mad at them can walk up and shoot them, or just sneak up on them to be a jerk and scare the heck out of them, you know? So, when these guys are working, obviously they're handling calls. Um, 
All of us are deputized by uh, Sheriff Parr to help with the county. Um, we spend a lot of time backing up uh, the sheriff's officers on traffic stops, calls that they have out in the county. Um, when they're not out patrolling, um, they might be in dispatch, giving the dispatcher a break so she can go to the bathroom. Um, they might be sitting at a shortstop mm -hmm. while they close up, making sure, and Dollar General and that kind of thing, hanging out in that area to make sure that their uh, uh, people aren't coming around and, and harassing them or trying to keep them safe or closing up. They might be out on the highway, they might be on 4th Street, 1st Street, anywhere in town around the radar. They might be on the library monitoring stop signs. They're doing traffic stops. When they're not out on the beat, then they're up in the office getting their reports done, doing interviews. Uh, speaking of interviews, uh, to address uh, some concerns, when uh, uh, my dad's pickup caught on fire the other night at the square, there were some comments made that it took or a city officer never showed up. Well, the reason the city officer never showed up is he was tied up with an, in an interview in a felony investigation. There was a deputy there that called it in. Law enforcement was there. Um, so that was a very good decision on his part to not interrupt his investigation and keep that going so we could get that tied up. Um, and another thing, as far as our investigations go, your average just your average investigation, if you have a prosecutable investigation, let's say it's a uh, burglary. And so we go to the lumber yard for a burglary. We process the scene, we take fingerprints if we need to. We take measurements, we do diagrams, we take photographs, collect evidence. You've got, in, in just a basic investigation there, you've got your couple hours tied up the scene. You've got, depending on if you, if you I'm, I said prosecutable, so I'm going to assume we have a suspect. Um, by the time you get your witness statements done from the business owners and get them back, if you ever get them back, um, by the time you interview your suspect, you get statements from them, you're already looking just for a simple burglary by the time you get the, on average for something like that, six, eight pages of paperwork done. You've tied up a couple shifts already because one thing we don't like to do is we're not going to just sit up at the office all day and do our reports. We'll get a chunk of it done, we'll go back out and patrol a while. Get a chunk of it done, go back out and patrol a while. So, from the start of your burglary to the time you get your report done, it gets to the county attorney, and you get a warrant issued for that person's arrest, could be anywhere from a couple weeks to six months. And then add in the time it takes to do your actual court proceedings, you might be looking at a year tied up for a simple burglary. And then you have the ones that throw you for a loop like the shooting we had in town from the time the initial investigation took place to the time he was exonerated in court. It was a matter of a couple months. It just depends on the circumstances um, and, and how that goes. It depends on how much time we're able to allocate our time to uh, conducting the investigation, why we're not doing other investigations and handling other calls. Um, I think that about covers what you guys do. Um, and as a working chief, I do the same with administrative paperwork. Um, that's another thing I firmly believe in. I'm, because I am a working chief, I'm not going to sit up in the office and do paperwork all day. I'm going to patrol, I'm going to make traffic stops, I'm going to handle calls, I'm going to catch cats and dogs and stucks and everything else. Um, but I also have um, the responsibility of <coughs> reviewing the reports these guys do. That way, when uh, the ones that we have to send to the county attorney, that we have to send to the KBI, arrest reports, our offense reports, all that kind of thing, I look over those along with Sergeant Rudy as well to make sure that those are complete. Um, sometimes I feel like a school teacher because I'm with the red pen marking grammar and, and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, and all of the other, any time these guys or myself go to training, I have to provide um, documentation to the uh, Kansas CPOS, which is the commission that handles our certifications. I have to provide documentation to them um, on, on all the stuff that we do. Our firearms qualifications, uh, Sergeant Rudy, because our, he's our range master, um, has to deal with paperwork on that. I have to sign off on that. It has to get sent to CPOS. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, I would say I probably spend at least an hour a day just doing administrative paperwork, approving reports, um, handling phone calls or complaints that come in from the community, salespeople ringing the phone off the hook, even though I told them to take me off their list eight times. Um, and again, you know, if, if we need, these guys call me and tell me that 
they ripped a pair of pants on a call because some dog was chasing them up a tree, well, then I've got to spend some time in the office or a uniform or whatever it is. Um, vehicle maintenance, the list goes, I mean, the list goes on and on. There's, we do enjoy low crime rate. We really do. However, there is a lot more to our job than just chasing cats and dogs and unlocking cars and doing that kind of thing. I, I, I really think if somebody spent a good few days or a week doing a ride along or shadowing an officer throughout a day or a shift, they would really get a good picture of what all is actually involved um, doing that. And, and something else that's involved in that is self-education. We are required a minimum 40 hours, but we constantly have to read, read uh, Supreme Court decisions, articles, training articles, so we can keep up on what we can do as far as search and seizure laws um, or search warrants and that kind of thing, because it changes all the time. So one thing we have to do to make sure that we are um, minimizing liability for the taxpayer is to make sure that we know what the heck we're doing. Because if we're not educating ourselves and we go out and illegally search somebody's car or house, then the city and that officer gets named in a lawsuit. And then before you know it, we're spending another $3 million on a water treatment plant, but because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. So that doesn't cover it all, but I, I think that's a pretty good picture. Suzanne, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question. Do, do you have any numbers at all as far as the surrounding communities? There's a great variance in size, say, like Hudson versus, you know, Radium. What are there, 70 people in Radium? As far as an officer to uh, citizen ratio, do um, we have anything like that? Maxville is around five, 545, five and a half, somewhere around their people. Um, they have two officers. Okay. Um, because of the size of their community, they're able to get away with, uh, excuse me, maintaining uh, officers that are technically on uh, part-time status. Okay. Because the officer, the chief and the officer over there are not only their police department, they're also their city maintenance. Okay. Yeah, you want to you talk about yeah, a wonderful... Jack of all trades. The yeah. guy, guys over there. They're, um, Stafford right now has... Five, right? Oh wow, that's. We got Doug, Cheryl, Joe, <coughs> Tony. They've got four. One, one part time. Yeah, so they've got four and one part time. I mean, I'm just wondering if if those numbers are available. Is that something the city council is using? You know, to to base their argument upon against the fourth officer. I am all in favor of the fourth. You know, when you sit there and you say, we enjoy a low crime rate, I don't think a lot of the people here, if you've never lived anywhere but here or in this area, you guys really have no idea how lucky we are. I've lived in Boston, Providence. I mean, you, you can't compare it. You can't compare it. And I think it makes perfect sense to be proactive rather than chase the crime at the tail end and not be able to keep up to maintain that presence, being at the school, on the streets, you know. And if it's in the budget, it's just beyond me why, you know, there's always going to be a naysayer, sure. okay? But why is this something people would be against? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I have my ideas of, of, of why what's going on, what's going on, but it would be unprofessional for me to say. Well, it's not unprofessional for me to be outside, I'll tell you all that. Uh, I have a couple of observations. One is... I would hate to have one of you folks be overtired or maybe feeling down and tired and because you're short-handed, you have to go to a domestic violence thing and you get hurt. Or you make a mistake and you shoot somebody that shouldn't be shot uh, just because you're too tired. But those are very real and good observations. Those observations are things that thankfully haven't happened here, but they've happened in other places plenty. And the second thing is that uh, I've been familiar a little bit with things that have gone on when I was more involved with this, but I haven't ever heard anybody have a good reason why we shouldn't have a fourth officer. And I've read the paper and everything, and most of the time, they won't give a reason why. And uh, I don't think that that makes 
sense because I'm not thinking of a reason why. And I, I hope Harry will chase them until they. <laughs> I have the reason why, but I really can't put it in frame here because, I mean, basically, I've had. No, basically, put it out in front of all of you. I've had two city council members tell me off the record, I just don't like the guy. As long as I'm on the city council, he'll never be cheap. Well, that didn't work out. We got cheap. So now they're just doing whatever they can, trying to make life miserable. Probably hoping that he gets fed up, tired of it, and quits. And that's exactly what it's all boiling down to. Yeah. You really want to know the truth. Yeah. That's what already happened once yes. recently. So you know, I don't want. What's going to happen again? I mean, yeah, I, I thought Stafford County has more police people per capita than Petcherson and Wichita, Graham County and Sager County. We've probably got twice the police officers in Stafford County. I would agree with that. I know. I, I think you need to look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. I, I think you'll find per capita. We've only got 4,000 people in the whole county. And per capita, I think you'll find out that we have way more officers than Graham County or Sager County. But we also have 800 square miles, too. I feel like nowadays, a lot of crime is turning from the cities and coming to the rural areas because of the lack of police officers. And they can seem to think that they can come out here and get things, you know, clean house. And that's one reason why I think a fourth officer would be a benefit to our community. Because it's proven that it has a lot of crime that's come out of the cities into the rural areas because they're easier to get. They're easier targets because they don't have the officers out there. It doesn't matter how many officers you have, you're not going to stop all the crime. Well, no, I, know, I agree yeah, with that. Yeah, you're under yeah. your under I agree with that, Jack. I totally agree with and, that. And, and, and to address, you know, there's also ideas of having the sheriff's department take over. Um, the only thing I have to say about that is that that sounds like a good idea in theory. Number one, it's not going to save any money because, first of all, the sheriff's department gets paid around about four to five dollars an hour more than what our officers get paid. Second of all, the sheriff's department, uh, for obvious reasons, has to provide a take-home vehicle to each officer um, so they can do their duties. The other thing is. Um, as long as any city, let alone St. John, has a city charter that says you will have a police department, the sheriff's department is not statutorily bound to handle any calls within the city limits. So if, if the idea is that you would like to get rid of your police department and have the sheriff's department take over, that's not something that can just happen in a day. That's something that would, that would very carefully have to be done. That way, you ensure that you're protected. Um, I can tell you, you know, if if for some reason I want, I needed an officer to respond to my house, one of these guys, I'm a heck of a lot more comfortable knowing they're at most a mile away than maybe up on the North County line on a traffic stop, and I have somebody trying to break into my house, um, or you have a domestic violence incident or something like that. Any one of us, any one of us here have handled domestic violence calls by ourselves, even though our policy says we can't, but just because the backup isn't available. We've all stopped people at two or three o'clock in the morning and wrestled with them, drunks and that kind of thing. And, you know, I, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. I got, I got made fun of when I first got on the police department because several weeks after I got on the police department, I started carrying two pairs of handcuffs. Somebody said, what were you carrying two pairs of handcuffs for? Well, about a month after I started, before I even got to the academy, right after I got on my own, I pulled over a vehicle with two, two drivers. The, the driver was drunk and the passenger was drunk. I ended up having to wrestle the driver and finally got handcuffs on him and then had to spend 10 minutes holding the other guy on the ground until backup finally arrived. And I didn't have any handcuffs. So you better try to put two pairs of handcuffs on because I had another pair. I wouldn't have to waste so much energy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of the things. I mean, it's. In the end, it is ultimately the city council's decision. However, it takes the community to voice their concerns and what they want in the end um, to possibly influence the decision either way. And what I said at the beginning, I didn't want to turn this into a, 
why we need three officers or why we need four or whatever. I, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the opinions and the comments. Um, the whole idea of this was to hear you guys out so you could see what, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and that kind of thing. Um, if you get a fourth officer, how do you work your shift later on? <coughs> how do you what? Are you going to make the new guy work the night shift now forever like Charlie's been doing? Or are you going to rotate around so the TV stays on? <laughs> Day, Being, when we had four officers in the past, we did rotate because we were able to shift. Um, Charlie's not on that shift because he's a new guy. But again, he, he, has been, he has been primarily on there because, again, it, it's not beneficial to the people we serve, the officer, to have to work them 24 hours straight to be able to flop the schedule and go the other way. I mean, trust me. I mean, I would I would enjoy working some more night shifts because I still enjoy going out and getting into stuff. I still enjoy going out and pulling over cars and, and all that kind of thing. That a lot of stuff you don't necessarily get to do in night shift. And if we had four officers, that would be another thing. I would take you know I would go my whole five days before my days off and work some night shifts because that's beneficial for me because that gets me out in the community and getting a feel for what's going on after the street lights come on versus just during the day. So yes, that would the rotation would be in effect as it had been in the past. Well, I will say that I delivered the Hutch paper all times of the morning, mm -hmm. anywhere from 1.30 to 4 a.m. And it is nice to see Charlie up on the square riding around because a lot of people in this town don't realize how many people is out walking the street or riding around or a lot of strange vehicles at a time in the morning, all hours. Some of us get <laughs> I mean, I found the, the school door open, the skating rink left and locked, the door standing open, you know, and I call the show's job to say no need. <laughs> but it's nice to see Charlie. I mean, we had a, a bum in our park sleeping on the table one night, you know, and over by the pop machines. I delivered the papers there, and he could easily, you know, it's nice that Charlie let me know there's somebody up there messing around. And that's another thing, you know, a lot of people seem to think that during our on-call time, we don't come out. And that's not true. If, if the dispatcher calls us for a call, we handle it. Now, if the dispatcher calls us at 5 o'clock in the morning because somebody almost ran over a chihuahua on their bicycle, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to advocate paying an officer time and a half to come out for 30 minutes and pick up this chihuahua. I mean, we, we, we use some common sense in that. And, and again, that's for the end result of the taxpayer because it's nonsense for them to have to pay, you know, extra money for something that can be handled later. Um, but it, it's, it's basically left up to the officer's discretion. Nine times out of ten, when we're on call, when we get a call, we're going to handle it. You know, it's going to take us a little longer to get there, but we're going to get there. How much family time do you get with just three officers? Well, I go to work and I go home. So I know, and that's but yeah, I mean, it, well, it's you know, it's more. It, you know, you guys work awfully hard. It's one of those things. Again, it comes back to the fact that yeah, it comes back to the fact that you know it is difficult. If you wanted to take a two-week vacation with your family, it's very difficult to do because the last thing you want to do is think about your guys being burnt out because they just worked two weeks in a row without a day off. And I know every time it seems like I need to have a vacation or training. And I get a plank complaint from my sergeant because stuff hits the fan. <laughs> and, and then he ends up working one of those 16, 18, 20 hour shifts on an investigation and, and that kind of thing. And have you approached the city council from a different point of view of maybe one or two part time people just to see how that would work? And I mean, if they're hung up on the money situations, I mean, would you take a different approach to one or two part time people? Yeah, we, we, we are we're, we're working on that right now. We actually have the opportunity now to well, we put to, to work a, a, a part-time officer or two. Um, two times in the past, we had advertised for part-time officers, and we didn't get one application, which, you know, you can, you can only do what you can do. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, we, we have that opportunity now that we're going to try to utilize that, but again, we come into problems because one of them happens to work for one of our neighboring jurisdictions and the chief of police over there happens to not like the fact that she wants to work some extra hours over here. So he's kind of messed with her schedule to make that not possible. Um, and then uh, the other one has just been a matter of being able to get his schedule ours. 
Yeah, I mean, if not, it would be a challenge. I mean, it would, it would be awesome if we, if we lived, you know, if we were in Rio County or something like that, and we could pick up a couple of retired officers that still wanted to come back and kick doors once in a while. But we just don't have it. And we don't, because the sheriff's department is as small as they are. I mean, them guys, they work there, you know, with deputies especially. You know, they work there, they work there two or three days a week. Um, and then they're on call from 5 in the evening on Friday night until 5 in the morning Sunday. And then on their days off, they're doing transports. Um, so, and I, I really think a really good testament to the fact that we are solving crimes is the amount of people we put in jail. At any given time, Stafford County alone has at least a dozen people in Pratt and Barton County jails. I mean, we, we're just ridiculous. I, I really feel sorry. Well, you, I see the checks. You see, yeah. you see the checks that go to them, and they're not small. They're not. Um, well, how many of the cases are actually getting prosecuted and something coming out of the end? Like, uh, not wasting, enough. After wasting your time. Not enough. I don't I understand what you're saying. Um a lot a lot factors into that, whether it's it's prosecuted or not. Um, when we elect our county attorney, um, if you guys read the paper and we publish this in there sometime, go to court, it's it's open. And just see how our county attorney performs and you would understand why some cases are going. Well, and that's the thing, you know, once once our investigation is complete and it goes to him, then it's out of our hands, hands and, and our job's done. So it's not done, we just have to testify in court. But, yeah, and, and, and that's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because we've had cases that were literally open and shut cases. You have, you know, you have your crime, you have your suspect, you interview your suspect, and he admits to the crime. And it goes nowhere. And then you have a case where it is a complete shot in the dark, and all of a sudden we have a jury trial, and we're going full board to get this thing done. So there are some some issues of priorities in there. Um, I don't. I hope nobody here thinks that we're talking about his back because we 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 talk to him, and discuss with him our issues, and we have. I've got a whole file folder of letters that I've sent to him with my issues on that kind of thing. So. I think the rest of us that elected him should be able to talk behind his back. <laughs> You're right. I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm not here bad mouthing somebody with something I haven't said in their face. I, I think the whole public needs to know that you guys pretty effective. Yep. Well, we got we got a whole lot of council members that are pretty ineffective too. <laughs> I mean, we got a public meeting here. Just remember when I get bashing. I'm not, I'm not bashing, I'm telling you the truth. We can, we voted for them. That's right. I did, I'll admit it, I texted two or three of them a while ago and said it's pretty sad that you guys can't even come to the public meeting. Well, hang on, I got it. I got it. Didn't, didn't come through and the other I haven't heard anything. They can't, though. Once they get more than two of them in any one place, uh, they have to buy law calls, call a special meeting. That's why they're not. So, so they, they send their family and the representative, is that what it is? I mean, I don't understand. Well, I'm, that's what I'm telling you. They're, the reason they're not here is because it would be a violation of the open. Have I already represented in one way or another? No, yeah. I'm not saying that. Okay. okay. Are you here representing you your son? Pardon me? No. no. Okay. You want to, I'm, what's, I'm, what are you I'm here to concern the taxpayer. Well, so am I. There's no reason to accuse these two on the front row. No, no, I, don't I don't think he's accused them. I just wanted to make sure I didn't, no, even, no, no, no. I didn't rever misrepresent myself. I, mean, I didn't even understand in the first place that I they weren't allowed. It's, it's, it's a violation of the Open Meetings Act if two or if, if more than two of them meet together. And uh, this is not a serious thing. I haven't done that a long time ago. That's always been my problem for years, years and years. There's more rules and regulations. This rule contradicts this law, and this law contradicts this rule, and we can't do this because of this law, we can't do this because of this rule. And quite frankly, it's a bunch of shit. Well, and, 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 here, just, here, and just to say something about that, you know, 
We all have to react gender, whether we like it or not. They're part of our culture and our society, and they're set up for some reason or another, whether they work or not. Yeah. Yeah. Not these guys that set those rules. No, I'm not saying that, but it enables them to do their job. I mean, and what I think that we're going to do something that changes that is probably slim to nothing to get up that far. Well, I'm not only talking about it on a public police level here. I'm talking about it clear on up. You said the Supreme Court. Yeah, you said the Supreme Court a while ago. I, that's what I'm thinking. They make so many rules, laws, and regulations that your guys' hands are tied to it. I mean, I understand. And it's a, it's crazy. The Supreme Court is it's not because <coughs> when we advertise our hands to some, to some things, it also protects your rights as much as it does theirs. And and we have always been careful not to step on anybody's rights. Whether it be the suspect, because heaven forbid we blow a case because we stepped on their rights, or the victim's rights as far as, as interviewing them and everything else. So some of them laws are in there to protect that as, as well as how the suspect is treated. And the, the hoops, while they're painting the butt, a lot of them are very necessary to make to maintain that, that we're honest and that the investigations are honest. And that it's not just, you know, uh, our word against theirs or anything like that. There has to be hoops we have to jump through, through to prove that, that what we say is fact is fact. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, beyond a reasonable right. doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, once it goes in front of a judge or a jury, it's, it's for them to decide. Mm -hmm. So, barring a reversal of the vote, is this, this is it then? It's set in stone that you won't get the fourth officer for the next fiscal year? Is that how they measure it? Well, no, bar, barring them voting otherwise, it's, it's that way until they vote otherwise. It, it, was, it wasn't a vote of we're not going to let you have until next year. It was a vote of we're not going to we're not going to retain a fourth officer. <laughs> not, it, it was a vote that we're not going to retain a fourth officer. Period. I mean, obviously, yeah, a reversal of the vote. What is the city's fiscal year from? It runs from July first to the end of June. That's real. I'm sorry. I'm getting. I'm, she's right. It's it's. It's, it's regular year round. I'm getting confused when we do our, our budget yeah, periods and all that. Budget is an 18 month process. Yeah. You know what it's going to take is if you people are in favor of the police having enough to work, enough people to work, like white people will not be worked to death, mm -hmm. you need to go to the city council meetings, you need mm -hmm. to talk to your city council members so that they're hearing from the rest of the people in the community and not just the ones that drink coffee out at Senex. Because that's where that. Four of them hang out, and that's kind of where all four of the attitudes come from. But that goes the other way. That goes the other way too. Yeah. The ones that don't want to see that have the same responsibility yeah. to make their, their voice heard too. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what we should do as a community: is that we need to get involved in going to the council, exactly, and standing our ground as citizens. That you know, we need to take it upon ourselves as citizens. Because I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, if if I felt that we had a majority of the community that was against it, then I wouldn't even be trying. To. But I don't, I don't think that's the case. Before the city council asked for your fourth officer, you just did the last meeting, or this has been a two-year process. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, you know, after. After Sonny Ralston retired, that they hired uh, a gentleman by the name of Matt Dale. Um, to make a long story short, mm -hmm. had some extreme integrity issues um, to the point that at a department meeting, I made him so mad that he was sitting across from me and he got up and jumped on the table and had his fist right back to hit me. He should have been fired then. Two months later, he, he, he was like that. Um, then after that, the job was offered to a gentleman from Reno, Nevada. He accepted the job. He came to town for a couple of days, looked around town, went back, and, and declined the job. And you would have had four officers. Well, and, and that's the thing. Either the, each, each time, when, when Chief Neal was hired and the, the other gentleman was hired, we would have had four, uh, four officers. And I have no doubts that if the other gentleman would have fully accepted the job and moved here and came, we would still have the roster. So it's yeah. really, really obvious what the problem is. 
I'm not going to call him. <laughs> <laughs> but well, that makes an excellent point. If there would have been four officers, then it, we would have already had the four officers. So why that was an issue to add to it when they were obviously going to hire four? Four after we said three on the other. Which part? They're going to hire the cops. That was the four. That was yes, the four. That was the progress. <laughs> But you can have water cups, can have water. If 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 you're if if the question really is about money, when when you when you and, it, and it's am I right? It's public information. What's in the accounts of the city? Yes. If if it's really about money, if you were to look at the daily balance or the monthly or whatever the balance is in the city and compare that to, I'm going to say forty thousand dollars. I don't I don't know if it's that much by the time you pay the salary and the benefits. It's not for the city. It's really but that's not a completely accurate statement either, because not all of the money that the city and city accounts is can be used for whatever. Right, I understand that. I'm just I'm just trying to say and allocations and certain funds can only be What's used the debt? And, and you and you gotta understand these are my opinions. Okay, these are my opinions. What is the debt? Yeah. I don't have any idea. The city sitting on something like three million unencumbered. I don't know. I think that's the last one that was on our website. Two hundred fifty thousand on the water plant. Uh -huh. Yeah, and they got the street messed up. And everybody was doing you know, that's one hundred thousand. Like compared to what that power plant brings in in a month, and like say when you're sitting on that much money, you can afford it. And it all boils down to the fact that it's been in the budget all these years <laughs> to have four officers. It's not like we're saying your taxes are going to go up because we're going to add a fourth officer. Mm -hmm. The city is going to be spending any more money than what has been budgeted out for the last how many years that they've had four officers. And as far as us having more police officers per capita in Wichita and stuff like that, it takes a minimum amount of officers to be able to, to do a 24 hour service or something. You can't put three wheels on a Rambler and then drive the thing down the road and bitch that it doesn't have a worth of crap because you only put three wheels on it. Well, that's why they hire a consultant. You know, you, yeah, and that's why they hire a consultant. And that's what's so irritating too. They pay the hire the consultant, thinking, well, he's going to go in there and say what we're saying. And then he does it, then they just ignore it. You don't ignore me, so I'm not going to take your advice. And a waste of money. They could have been donated. I mean, it could have gone towards towards the fourth one. Do you all have any other questions for us? <laughs> I appreciate you guys coming. And honestly, I'd like to say one more thing. Yeah. What I see, the perception, is that you guys are doing. You're, we do you're, way too. Yeah, you're active in the community, and a lot of times perception is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. You know, sure. it's just what we see because we're not on the inside. I appreciate the fact that you're active with our kids at school. Mm. Thank you. I also appreciate the fact that you can handle this in a professional manner that meant a lot to me. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Mark. You know, during council, you know, I asked the question after the vote what the reasons were, why they voted, why they voted. No comment is unacceptable in my opinion. It's unacceptable to the community and it's unacceptable to these police officers who are working their butt off. I just feel that we need, as a community, I'm your representative. I've had the majority of people come up to me and tell me a fourth officer is needed. No comment is not right. You deserve an answer. You put us there, you can take us out. That's all I have to say about that. And you're doing a fantastic job, all of you. For sure. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm Julianne Owens and I'm the mayor. For those of you who don't know me or haven't met me. A um, couple of things. We have a financial planning workshop scheduled for Saturday, December 7th in the community room of the library from 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. Basically what we're going to do is sit down, pick the city's budget apart, look at what we have in debts, look at what we have in monies coming in, look what we have in equipment, what's going to need to be replaced, what kind of projects we have coming up, what kind of things we're going to have to do to comply with airborne regulations and repowering engines at the power plant so that we're in compliance with emissions regulations. All that wonderful stuff that we're required to do by the federal and state governments. Our police department knows that I support them 100%. I always have. 
Um, I am not a vo voting voice on the council. I try and take the approach of being more of a moderator. They're the ultimate decision makers. If you feel strongly about an issue, please come to the council meetings. We want to hear what you have to say. We work for you. You vote us into office because you have confidence for a, 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 of us that we will make the right decisions. <coughs> If you don't feel like we're making the right decisions, take a half an hour of your time. Come to the beginning of the meetings where we have a public comment section. You're gonna be welcome to speak. I can promise you that. And if you feel like a fourth officer is necessary, come and let the rest of the council know. Because it's important they hear it from you. Not from a Facebook page, not from a newspaper article, but from the citizens of this community. Yes, ma'am. It is important, but that's not always been the case here. You used to have to actually put in a form to be able to speak at those meetings. Well, not, any, not anymore. After we <coughs> wrote that, you can come to a meeting and sign up. Just write your name and your okay. address, that, and you can speak. Then that's different if you right. have something that needs to take, be taken care of, okay. bring it in on Friday so we can get that right. information that's in our packets. So, but, but, okay, so yes. that wasn't okay. always the case. To answer right. Mike's question, when did that change, Mike? Yeah. When Mark refused to sponsor me for a council meeting, when we were getting ready to do the nitrate removal plant, and he was advised not to, and I went to another council member and was sponsored anyway, and his conscience got the better of him, and he went to the newspaper office and told his story. That's when that changed. We have people in this community with integrity. And our council members, because I've spoken with all of them individually, they do have the best interests of this community at heart. But we're human beings, and we all have our own personal things that we deal with. Backbiting, taking things into your own hands, Anything along those lines doesn't give council the opportunity to hear how you're feeling and what you have to say. Give them a chance. And I'm not talking about give them a chance standing out at the shortstop over coffee or standing in villains when they're trying to grab groceries or whatever. Come to a meeting. Let your voice be heard. That's the beauty of our government system is that we have that right as citizens. I'm not a local. Family and I have been here, it'll be seven years in January. I love this community. It's a wonderful place to raise a family, to have children. It's still safe. You don't have to worry about locking your doors by and large. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to worry about making sure your car is locked most of the time. You know, most of us do anyway because we just got into that habit. But we have a safe community here. And we have a nice community here. I want to see it stay that way. I have a nine-year-old daughter. So I, too, appreciate Adam's walkthroughs in the school. I work at the school. You know, if we had a shooter come in, I know what I would do. But. It's nice to know that we have a police force that is aware and diligent. So, I just I really want to encourage you guys to come to a council meeting and to let your voice be heard. And not just those of you that are here. Pass the work. We want to hear from our citizens. It's important so that we can direct our government to the best of everybody. We're there to represent you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get done, I just the last thing I want to say is <coughs> I have uh, I, I've got I brought a bunch of business cards with me before you guys leave. If you want one, it has my personal email address on it. Um, I can put our department email address on it. It's got our, the, the phone number. If you see me on the street or either of these two guys on the street and you have a 
question, a problem, a complaint, anything, please approach us. We, we encourage it. Um, I'm confident that the issues we've discussed here tonight, we've been going through long enough that these guys can probably answer any questions you have. If not, they'll give them to me and I will. If I'm at the police department, to this day, I have never shut the door to my office. My office is always open. I am always open to speak with anybody for whatever amount of time it takes until I gotta go chase another dog. <laughs> so, again, I appreciate you guys coming. I appreciate the feedback. And uh, we'll probably, in the future, try to do this again sometime and, and keep on giving you guys the opportunity and anybody else the opportunity to, to bring stuff to us and get a feel. And, and so everybody's on the same page and, and we can do the best we can to serve you because that's what we do. We're, we're here to serve you guys. You're basically our customers for life, no matter what. And we want to do the best that we can for you. Adam, I just want to say to you, about dogs, you know, all three of you know, I've called you many times. <laughs> <laughs>